Good morning to all of you and welcome to FSR debates. Uh, my name is Andris Piebalks and so today we have, will have the most, uh, I think, fascinating issues that uh, Fit for 55 as proposed. There are many fascinating issues, but uh, it's definitely cornerstone of all the transition for investments and and basically for the most difficult issues that we need to answer in the carbonization process. And it is the Commission's new gas and hydrogen package. I would like to start by congratulating the uh, Commission really with coming with this proposal because there have been so much expectation from different uh, stakeholders and also different expectations. But today we will know how much they are uh, satisfied with this. Uh, Today is also a particular day for energy as usual uh, from taxonomy D-Day. Well, not too much, I think, uh, uh, changes are to be expected from delegated act. So it's about nuclear and the gas conditions for being recognized in taxonomy. Uh, today we will have also issues that uh, Commissioner Breton will speak about strat standardization strategies that will influence and definitely soaring energy prices and uh, and support for people uh, uh, coping with high energy prices is still in the center. But if we see this, all the actions uh, that are coming, uh, we definitely should not forget the main issues that in front of us, it is achieving carbon neutrality by 2050. And there is no different choices that needs to be done. And we know that this need to be achieved in the most economically efficient way. And we also have a half target in 2030, 55% uh, carbon cutting. Uh, and it is not just some, some well target, it is crucial milestone to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. So the commission's proposals that uh, goes in the clean molecule direction is uh, very much needs to strike the right balance uh, between supply, demand, and uh, all the enabling environment for um, low carbon and hydrogen and, uh, and hydrogen really to come into this game. So we will look how key stakeholders are looking on this package, what are the highlights of it and where the worries are. And then we will go to, to some of the issues uh, that are very specific. I would uh, ask our audience not to hesitate. And if you have a question uh, for one particular member or for the whole panel, please put your question in, in the box. I will try to use as much uh, as possible your questions really in steering the debate. Today in our debate, we have uh, Keith van der Leyen, uh, Managing Director, Common Futures. Uh, so it is an energy transition specialist, uh, So, but Keith is well known to our audience. Ilaria Conte, uh, Head of Gas, Hydrogen and Decarbonization Area. You hear from Florence School also has adjusted after the package, not anymore as gas area. It's much more complicated, but it also reflects what actually happens. James Watson, Secretary General Eurogas. Uh, you know that Eurogas is association representing the European gas wholesale retail distribution sectors. And we have a new uh, face. Well, I know Piotr for quite a time. Piotr Kusch, uh, General Director, ENSOC. Uh, he started his job only in January 2022, but he know well the subject and well known, I think, for some at least part of our uh, audience. Dennis Hesseling, head of infrastructure, gas and retail department of ASAR, has been always with us during this time and I'm very much keen in looking. And conclusions was agreed to make by Augustin van Osteren, a senior expert and team leader, decarbonization and sustainability of energy uh, sources from the European Commission, DJ Ener. So welcome to all of you. And I wanted to start this really for more broader view on the package and uh, the highlights and the general perception from different stakeholders. And ACER, uh, European regulators, definitely is the starting point. So Dennis, please, uh, the floor is yours. How do you evaluate the package? Uh, well, I know it, you could tell, tell quite a lot, but the most focused points. 
Thank you very much, Andres, for the uh, for the kind introduction and the invitation to be here. Um, indeed, I think you framed the, the whole package already very well, saying this is necessary step to uh, bring the whole gas sector in line with the decarbonization objectives. And also for us as energy regulators, uh, so far our mandate has been focused on efficiency, efficiency of investments, fair access, ensuring competition at European level, ensuring European market integration for gas and electricity. But the climate dimension was missing. And I think the year the package that the Commission put forward um, is really a necessary step and overall a very positive step to make sure that energy regulation can align with the climate uh, goals and can contribute to the decarbonization of the energy sector. Um, of course, we have discussed with Augustine and the Commission colleagues uh, quite a bit last year in the development phase. We're very happy uh, overall, let's say, with the package that came out. And what I'll share with you is uh, a number of observations uh, focused a bit more on regulatory topics, uh, because basically that's where we, um, well, where we come in and where we can add more, uh, more value. Let's see if, yes, I have full screen. Um, starting with a, a number of, let's say, almost classical uh, regulatory topics, unbundling, access regimes, uh, and also exemptions. Um, and here, of course, the thinking is, how do you apply these, uh, these, these concepts, which have been used in a very useful way, we think, um, in an existing natural gas sector, and now you start to apply them to a hydrogen sector, which still has to develop. So the whole investment question on this that you mentioned um, is, of course, very different if you compare the existing natural gas sector to a, well, a nascent uh, hydrogen sector. Um, still, we think that the proposals, uh, which now include different types of unbundling. Um, so we know, of course, the vertical unbundling between the transmission, the monopoly part of the sector from uh, generation, supply, trading, um, that is well covered, we think. Um, horizontal unbundling is added here when it comes to transmission for hydrogen versus transmission for natural gas to separate those activities. And also what we now started calling diagonal unbundling, uh, where the most concrete example is, could a gas TSO be involved in the production of hydrogen? That's a new question. We didn't have that question before in, in the gas sector itself as a diagonal, let's say, unbundling issue. And we think those issues are properly, properly covered by the commission's uh, proposal. When it comes to access regime, um, we know from, um, from the gas sector that we had NTPA, well, some countries had NTPA in the very beginning, negotiated third party access. Um, here the proposal is to have this negotiated regime as a possibility until 2030, but after from 2031 onwards, um, all have to move towards regulated third party access. And of course, there's a bit uncertainty about the date, is 2030 the right date or not? But overall, the idea of having flexibility in the beginning when there is a need to mobilize um, financial resources for the investments and offering more flexibility. We think that is positive and NTPA could offer that in the early stages. But still, once we move towards a more integrated um, network system, which may resemble more the system as we know it nowadays from natural gas in Europe, we do think that RTPA, so regulated third party access, is the, the regime which has proven to work well to ensure competition, to enable competition. Um, and that's where we, uh, where we need to go. And we think it's good that the legislation already clarifies from the beginning that to any investor that they know that over time after uh, a decade, uh, RTPA will kick in and they can take it into account in the way they set up their business case. Um, there's the ITO model, the independent transmission operator, uh, which will be phased out for hydrogen after 2030. Um, from our perspective as regulators, this makes our life easier. The ITO is, a, in our view, a historical legacy in the gas sector. Uh, it requires quite some oversight by regulators that is not ideal solution. So we think it is quite uh, positive to, um, to phase this out uh, for hydrogen after 2030. We see there are sufficient, in our view at least, um, um, uh, exemption possibilities for existing private hydrogen undertakings. Of course, there are already companies now who have some hydrogen uh, transportation pipelines um, in the field uh, in countries like Belgium. And we think it's good that they have uh, possibilities, at least until 2030, um, to be derogated from the, the new rules. And that's, again, quite a long time, which should uh, ensure sufficient um, flexibility for them. Then after 2030, there are derogations available for these um, geographically combined uh, hydrogen networks, uh, which, again, ensures quite a flexible approach. The one question we have here, um, as Augustin knows, um, we're not sure 2030 as a single date for the whole EU will actually work, uh, because if you now look at the, the investment plans, the different conditions in the different member states, we see a, a wide variety with some member states uh, like the Netherlands moving very fast, other member states 
well, hardly moving at all in this particular field. Um, and then saying for all 2030 has to be the, the, the big bang date. Uh, we're not sure that works. We would actually favor a more gradual approach. Moving then to the issue of renewable low carbon gases, terrification, uh, and also for hydrogen um, and blending, which has been debated quite a bit. Um, we think that setting a, a blending cap in principle at a level of 5% is uh, quite a good way of ensuring uh, sufficient harmonization at European level. There's also the possibility to derogate from this uh, between neighboring member states if they can agree on a higher cap that is possible. So it offers quite some flexibility. At the same time, it ensures a certain level of homogeneity at European level so that this, this blending, if it takes place, cannot be, um, become a, a barrier to cross-border trade. For renewable and low carbon gases, there's a proposal to remove the cross-border tariffs, um, which in a way makes sense to, to uh, promote them. Um, we think the review that is included there after five years is really important because in the end, you do need some gases or some shippers basically to pay for using the network. You cannot remove um, tariffs all the time. What is really difficult here is this proposed um, ITC, the Inter-TSO Compensation Mechanism. Um, we know this has been tried in some regions, for instance, in the Baltic region, they're still you're working on this. It is really complex to negotiate. And in the absence of any clear European rules or even guidelines, it's basically up to the, the TSOs and the NRAs to negotiate this. That can take a very, very long time. So it's... It's possible, it's a very complex situation. We don't see an explicit rule for the national regulators to oversee this, even though this has clear tariff or financial flow, let's say, uh, implications for the regulated entities and that needs to be ensured. Um, and in the end, what is difficult here is that the reasoning behind the removal of these cross-border tariffs for renewable and low carbon gases is to enable more competition to take place between them. That's great. At the same time, we see that at this moment, at least, uh, what determines mainly the competitiveness of the various renewable and low carbon gases are the national subsidy regimes. So what you're actually creating then is competition between national subsidy regimes, which is not the best way to have competition. So maybe there's a bit of more thinking uh, needed to see how this could be, uh, be fine-tuned to over time ensure uh, proper competition between these renewable and low carbon gases. For hydrogen, there's a similar story here. Also, the proposal is to have... Um, no cross-border tariffs. We are a bit worried about the, the loss of cost reflectivity. Not saying that every single cross-border tariff at this moment is cost reflective, but the opposite, removing any cross-border tariffs for hydrogen um, does not ensure cost reflectivity in our view either. Because in the end, if gases are using more of the network, there's also a, a rationale to charge them more for that. And that means that over the distance component is clearly cost reflected. And if you use more, that could also be, that maybe should also be a charge uh, for that. The other thing we would like to note here is that there is this system of having um, the CBCA cross-border cost allocation between neighboring member states on a project by project basis. That could work in the beginning because in the beginning, the hydrogen system needs to be built up and you'll have projects here and there, that's fine. We're not sure that would be a feasible long-term solution. And so in the end, if you really want to go this way, you may have to think, even though it also has drawbacks, about an ITC, uh, similar to the one that was, is proposed for uh, renewable and low carbon gases, but maybe with more, uh, let's say, clearer European structure around it. Then a difficult and sensitive topic is the art of financial transfers. Um, uh, is there a possibility to have financial transfers from the natural gas, let's say, system to the new, newly developed to develop a hydrogen system? And what is the role of the RAP, the regulated asset bases there? In principle, we are, as regulators, against uh, cross-subsidies, in particular against structural cross-subsidies, because at the end, um, the companies, the ones who are using the networks, need to pay for their own costs. What the Commission proposal does have, to be fair to them, is, is quite a number of meaningful guarantees, including a role for us as Acer, to make sure that this asset value is determined in a proper way to limit the size and duration of the financial uh, charge and also the allocation criteria. And it says very clearly also the wrap itself, so the regulated asset base cannot be used as a means for cross subsidization. It has to be an objective way of valuing the assets when they move from natural gas to a new hydrogen entity. Finally, on the, uh, the last two topics that you also suggested, Andres, uh, energy and integrated energy planning uh, and consumer engagement. Um, we very much welcome the idea to have a more coordinated planning 
across energy carriers, across the different levels. So also including the distribution level that is necessary as we move towards more to decarbonization. It doesn't make our life easier. It becomes more complicated, but it, it can ensure a better way of, um, of coordinating the planning across the different uh, energy vectors. This energy system integration is not something we think that can be solved by this piece of legislation alone. Of course, TENI, energy efficiency, and then RED2 already mentioned, they play an important role as well. And from our perspective, the fact that we now under the new TENI have this possibility as ACER to issue what is called framework guidelines for scenario development. So setting requirements, how the scenarios on which the infrastructure investments should be built uh, are developed um, is one step, is one way to ensure um, well, hopefully a more uh, neutral and more integrated uh, approach towards um, energy network planning. A practical comment on the uh, NOH, uh, as it is now called, and the, um, the approval of the uh, hydrogen national plans by the national regulators. There are certain requirements which need to be met. Um, if we think through the timelines, we're not sure this can be in place already in 2024, which is two years from now. And actually, it may, ta may take five years or more longer before we actually get there. It's a practical point, but since it's in the legislation, it's still, I think, important to flag. Finally, on the consumer side, by and large, we're, we're quite happy here because most of the clean energy package provisions, which already ensured consumer protection uh, for electricity consumers, and we've seen now with these recent price hikes uh, how important they are, most of them have been mirrored. We're very happy about those. There's a few missing uh, on energy poverty and vulnerable consumers. Uh, we understand the commission considers these to be covered by more general, more generic legislation. Uh, from our perspective, since we have them explicitly mentioned in the clean energy package, we would prefer actually to have them also um, here in this package to make sure that it's clear that also gas consumers will benefit from protection when it comes against energy poverty uh, and especially for vulnerable consumers. Again, these are a few of the more, let's say, critical comments um, that doesn't take away that, uh, again, as I said at the beginning, we're very happy with the package overall. We think it's a really good step in the right direction and it's necessary to ensure regulation can move forward and can align with the climate goals. I'll stop here, Andres, and hand back to you. Thank you. And thank you for your questions coming in. After the first round of introductory statements, we will move to, to unbundling. I see that is the first uh, that is really getting most worries. So, so we will hear also Dennis' views. I will not put him directly to the question because we have other uh, statements to hear. Uh, so I would like now Piotr Kusch, uh, uh, General Director of uh, ENSOC, uh, uh, to come with his statement. Uh, Piotr, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Andris. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us to this panel. Uh, I am very glad to share with you some of our first uh, uh, reactions to the proposed, uh, uh, proposed uh, gas and hydrogen package. We really welcome the, the commission package and, and all of the thought which was given by the commission to, to put it in place uh, and also to address the aspects of, uh, of climate policy. Uh, we see uh, a number of very valuable legislative proposals that, uh, that are serving uh, uh, speeding up decarbonization processes via gas market. Uh, to start with, it is really worth mentioning that uh, uh, current uh, draft is strongly anchored in uh, one single legal framework for, uh, and based on, on gas and hydrogen, so based on already existing principles for gas markets. And this makes... Uh, us, ENSOC and TSOs uh, as the important participant of this plan reforms and uh, that, that is here we want to really uh, contribute here. Um, there are a number of items that we would like to really welcome and, and see that they are really important here. So first of all, uh, we see that uh, low carbon gases are included in this policy framework as an integral part of this new setup. Um, Talking a lot about investments, uh, we really appreciate is uh, the fact that uh, there is a possibility to, uh, to include cost mutualization and taking our participation in repurposing of the networks is of crucial importance, especially when we take uh, into account the first stage of network development that will underpin the market ramp up of hydrogen. Of course, we are fully aware that it has to take place under close and strict regulatory scrutiny. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we really appreciate also the flexibility which was included in the package. So the possibility to firstly apply negotiated TPA to our networks and then go uh, to, to regulate the TPA after the certain time of the, uh, of the processes. Uh, 
Other two important items that maybe are not here at the heart of the heated debate is uh, uh, security of supply. So that's, uh, this is also addressed some short-term and mid-term challenges. If we look at the transformation, we are fully aware that it shouldn't be made with detriment to uh, security of supply and the market functioning, uh, especially for, for, for gas market. We really welcome new tools proposed by the Commission, but we see also that they will have to be uh, discussed for a week. Another important item are methane emissions, and, and we are fully aware also uh, a sense of that uh, this, is, this is an important matter and uh, it is very important to further reduce the methane emissions. So we really work on the proposal and uh, as TSOs, we are committed to reduce uh, CH4 emissions uh, and support this global methane pledge. Uh, in general, uh, we believe that the proposals should really take into account and support the current activities of TSOs and, and ANSOC in the framework of decarbonization and networks transformation towards the future. Uh, TSOs, uh, as I said, will play uh, an important part in, in making this uh, energy transition possible. First of all, with our existing assets, we will deliver experience and, and make use of synergies. There is a lot of talk about synergies between the investments and between uh, the networks that will gradually adapt to more renewable gases and, and hydrogen. And here we are really willing to, to support the development of uh, future EU energy infrastructure. Uh, it is worth mentioning that uh, ANSOC is already acting along our 2050 roadmap and we engage with stakeholders on various fora to discuss the future of gas infrastructure. And we have to be aware that uh, uh, the, the, the future uh, hydrogen network is likely to be de developed largely from repurposed gas infrastructure. Such an, such an approach we see already has proven to be considerably more economical uh, than the construction of the new infrastructure. So here we also take, uh, take to, into account all the societal costs of, uh, of energy transformation. Of course, we are also fully aware that part of the hydrogen uh, uh, revolution will, be, will take place uh, via retrofitting and via blending strategies that are also uh, important in particular regions of, uh, of uh, Europe. And that's why we see this uh, 5% uh, uh, cap for uh, hydrogen at the interconnection points as something that is really important. We also include uh, hydrogen and uh, gather already project for hydrogen infrastructure in uh, uh, our QNDP. So this is also something that already is taking place. That's why we want to have really uh, integrated approach and long-term vision on how the systems are evolving. I also believe that at this point, uh, we are re really thoroughly analyzing the current proposals and their impact uh, and practical implications to the market and especially TSOs. And having said that, uh, well, I would like to draw your attention to the several aspects that are related to, first of all, market functioning, uh, the governments, and finally, institu institutional setup that has been already touched upon here today. So on the market functioning, we, uh, we see zero tariffs uh, proposal for low carbon gases in gas networks as well as 100% discounts on tariffs with, with IPs on hydrogen as uh, very, challenging, uh, very challenging proposals uh, that are related of course with certain risks that will create some artificial congestions and the collection of revenues from TSOs will follow on the, on the exit points that will leads to some collection and leads to some, I would say, asymmetric uh, cost collection with the domestic or end users uh, and putting the costs on them. The further consequence of this is also practical because then we would see ITC mechanisms as some uh, new tools or, or very impractical and lengthy to introduce. So that's why we suggest to, to maybe concentrate on some voluntary cross-border market managers. And we already base our uh, uh, views here on uh, Favadi's discussion, which took place for years, and that should be really, uh, really made uh, very carefully assessed, as we know that some of the markets are not yet functioning. So this is something that we also should take into account. Secondly, if we look at uh, institutional setup uh, and the matter of NOH, here uh, as TSOs, we are not fully convinced that the, the proposal uh, and the idea and the timeline of setting ENSO goes in line with de delivering the uh, the most uh, the most uh, seeked uh, system integration and synergies that could be created by uh, by transferring uh, assets and activities of of current uh, uh, TSOs uh, for the hydrogen market. Uh, 
I think that we still miss a bit uh, of clarity of how, how, how the process should go, what could be the tasks. And of course, as Denshin already, Dennis already mentioned, that uh, there is still very ambitious timeline to set, set up such an organization and uh, to, to put the tasks and, and of course the, the respective res the responsibilities related to, for example, network planning or, or de de delivering networks. Uh, finally, a uh, few words about, uh, about uh, governance. This is something that was also really uh, important here. So we have the, the matters of uh, unbundling. And of course, with horizontal unbundling, uh, uh, we see that uh, in some, at some point, the, the account unbundling and, uh, uh, and separating assets could already uh, ensure enough transparency, transparency and uh, we see that financial transfers between natural gas and hydrogen can be already traced. So uh, we are still thinking about how legal uh, separation of hydrogen network operators and TSOs is, is, uh, is proportionate. Then, of course, we, we are wary of the fact that such processes will probably also put some burden and administrative uh, issues for, for, the, uh, for the TSOs. And what we see is also very important to clarify is, 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 uh, is a number of uh, other provisions that are related to information and, uh, and uh, exchange between the various parts of the businesses. So, uh, so of course, then we should have uh, needed flexibility and, and be allowed to, to introduce as many synergies as possible in, in transferring to hydrogen activities. Finally, a few words about unbundling. And, and here, of course, uh, uh, as NSOC, uh, we are representing the TSOs, which are running their businesses under all uh, the regimes that are currently applicable for the, um, for the gas networks. And here, what I can say that uh, if we look at, at, uh, at practical uh, functioning and the history, you can say that it is also confirmed by, by uh, uh, European Commission and the regulators that current unbundling models for energy infrastructure are serving well and they are proven to function. So uh, we don't see any, any drastic uh, need for, for changing the situation. And, and we believe that uh, all the unbundling regimes uh, should be applicable also to the hydrogen markets and provide for uh, all, the, uh, all the TSOs, the level playing field of, uh, of entering to, to, to the new activities. Of course, we see uh, with this uncertainty, uh, we see some of, uh, of our members that they really lack uh, a bit of, uh, of uh, sureness and, and stability when it comes to them investing in the longer run to, uh, towards uh, hydrogen infrastructure and, and uh, with, uh, uh, with also uh, lack of clarity what will, be, uh, what will be their situation after the 2030, like it is proposed uh, in a current policy proposal. Uh, so I think I will stop here and, and maybe can continue. Thank you, Piotr. Uh, so you partially already made some answer to, to answer some of the questions, but we will come back, as I told, we will start with unbundling issues, particularly the issue you ended on ITO. Uh, does really it helps uh, and what are our pro and what are contra arguments, but that we hear it. Now I would like to move to James. Uh, James uh, Watson, uh, your uh, Eurogas has discussed, started to, to hear of, of the package immediately after it was adopted. I know the DG Energy Director, uh, Siko Maniv, came immediately. So, so you really get in it. What are the perception of uh, you at this stage, what is right, what is not exactly, and does it provide for smooth supply of renewable and low, uh, low carbon hydrogen to the consumers? Andreas, thanks so much. Yeah, it is, of course, a great pleasure to be here again. And uh, I really do appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to speak to so many people about this very, very important package that has been put on the table for us. Uh, and I can say that in general, when Eurogas look at the, the package, we can say that we are uh, welcoming, supportive of the overall uh, objectives that have been uh, laid out. Eurogas, as you know, uh, fully supports the ambition to achieve climate neutrality by 2050 and indeed uh, to reduce carbon emissions by at least 55% by 2030. So when we look at the package, we can say, okay, this is a, you know, a good start. Uh, you know, everything has a good start, I suppose, Andres. That's how you we, how we look at these things. But... Uh, it's the overused phrase, the devil is in the detail. Uh, you just asked me about whether or not there's a, you know, a good 
uh, regime for the supply, uh, its developments, even if you will, and delivery of renewable and low carbon gases. And this is where we'd have to say there's a big question mark. It's very hard for us to identify the drivers, the development drivers for hydrogen, uh, for low carbon hydrogen, for biomethane, renewable gas. Where are the drivers? Where's the demand? Where is the demand actually being generated? And I compare that with the Renewable Energy Directive, for example. Renewable Energy Directive, as you all know by now, has targets for renewable hydrogen in industry and in transport, the so-called RFNBOs, which I do like, we just basically in your gas try to call it green hydrogens, make it more simple. The, the reality is that even then, those drivers aren't particularly big, but they are our drivers. We don't really see any drivers in this package. There's no drivers for the uptake. Where is the end user being considered? That's, that's one of the things that I think is critical and is missing. You know, in Eurogas, we've long suggested to the European Commission, to Acer, to whoever would listen to us, actually, Dennis, <laughs> that's no meeting with me. Yeah, we believe that there should be targets. This is well supported across 13 other associations from heating, co-generation, turbine manufacturers, as well as the transmission system uh, and, of course, EBA and others. The, the reality is that without those targets, it is hard to imagine what the driver is. When we meet with the European Commission, they will tell us that the driver will be the carbon price. I'm certainly not against the carbon price. We think that's a good idea. But on the other side, Renewable Energy Directive, Energy Efficiency Directive, you set targets. Targets plus CO2 pricing usually equals delivery. Maybe on energy efficiency, it's a bit slower than we would have liked. But this is the reality. And we think that not having targets for the volume of renewable gas we will need in 2030, the amount of GHG emission reductions we need in the gas sector by 2030 is a huge missed opportunity. So we don't see the demand drivers, which means that when we end look at it, what we are looking at is, I think actually, what Dennis has presented is a very good overview of what is there. It is a, a very much looking at the gas market and how the gas market functions and how a nascent, yet non-existent hydrogen market might function. I'm afraid it might be non-existent and nascent for the next 10 years, looking at the legislation without the demand drivers. The, the reality for me is that you can say, okay, well, we have 80 gigawatts of electrolyzers that should be 40 in Europe and 40 elsewhere. So it's still a really, you know, a drop in the gas ocean. So there is a lack of demand drive. Um, I'll move on from that point, Andrew, because I think I've you know, labored it very strongly, but this is the reality. Uh, so we can say from a gas market perspective, when we look at it, uh, we think, okay, this is actually pretty good. Dennis has picked up the key points on consumers. Uh, we see very good mirroring uh, with the Clean Energy for All package, which the electricity consumers have had since 2019. So we can say, okay, this is good. We see that, you know, you do have these basic rights being mirrored, you know, switching. Um, energy communities, quite interesting, again, seems to focus more on methane than on hydrogen, but yes, energy communities will be there. Uh, smart metering. Uh, single points of contract, out of court settlements, and even, uh, I'm going to have to discuss this again a little bit with Asa, the regulated prices element, which we don't really support in Eurogas, but we do, of course, in the context of this, uh, this crisis, recognize the need to protect the vulnerable consumers. This is absolutely fundamental. And so, yeah, we're very happy to see that there will be some recognition of that, which I think is a reflection of the situation that we're in. So we can say on the consumer side, I think overall, we're very happy. We think they've done a good job of generally mirroring. There are some areas that need to be tweaked, but in principle, it's been a strong approach and it is trying to put consumers of gas products into a good, good place. I think in terms of the definitions, when we look at things like low carbon uh, hydrogen, we might say, okay, 70% is quite good uh, in the sense of that we were saying, you know, we had looked at something between 60 and 90, so 70 seems to be somewhere uh, about right. But the fact is that doesn't really mean anything at the moment because the methodology uh, will be delayed until a delegated act, which won't be ready until 2024. Uh, that's, you know, two years from now. Uh, so for the next few years, what are we supposed to do? Isn't the answer is that, is that nothing? I, I'm very interested in what Augustine thinks about that. So we will find out in 2024 what that 70% really means. Uh, and this is then when we must say, well, okay, there must be consistency with the red and what is being done with the union database what is being looked at in terms of guarantees of origin, so that if we do have that low carbon uh, definition and methodology, it can be applied into certificates that can also be traded alongside what is already set up in the red. Many things that are missing, I suppose you might say, some important links. So I say welcoming in general, but devil is in the detail. Uh, I will be very brief on two final points. Uh, role of DSOs, as you mentioned at the beginning, Andres, we represent markets plus the distribution. 
The rogue DSOs, particularly in relation to hydrogen, is somehow left floating about, a bit like a butterfly, difficult to understand which flower it's supposed to land on. I think much more clarity is needed in what the DSOs uh, are supposed to be doing and what are expected of them. Um, there's no mention really of how gas DSOs would be integrated into the DSO entity. And this doesn't seem to me to be very open in the way that we would expect it to be to explain how DSOs will also take part in the planning process. So more effort needs to be given and more guidance from the Commission, I think also for the Member States and the European Parliament to understand how they see the role of DSOs, particularly in relation to hydrogen, but very much importantly in terms of planning. Uh, they will need to be there. Anaerobic digesters, electrolyzers, perhaps you know some of the gases of the future will be attached to distribution grids. So there must be an understanding of what their role is and how they will be involved in that planning. Not there. Uh, methane, final point. Hasn't I think anyone's really touched on this yet. Uh, I think that the reality is for us, again, something you can welcome. In fact, the ambition is good. I mean, Europe really can lead the way here. However, perhaps the elements of it in terms of monitoring, reporting and verification are beyond uh, the onerous into almost the ridiculous. Uh, if you are supposed to be uh, measuring every three months your distribution grid, don't forget there's 2.2 million kilometers of it, around 80% in Europe is polyethylene. Uh, for example, I was speaking to the Portuguese distribution system operator, they have a grid that's less than 10 years old, which is made of polyethylene, which doesn't really have any leaks, yet they are going to be required every three months to monitor and report that doesn't really seem to make sense. Where we should be focusing is on places where we perhaps do have leaks, where we do have much more work to do. And I think that instead of this general, let's just say every three months we must do this, there should have been better understanding of where we need to focus uh, on the pipes that are old, on the pipes that are perhaps steel, perhaps risky from embristlement if there's hydrogen blending. This would have made much more sense, much more value for money for the, the taxpayers are going to pay for that. Uh, our view is that that hasn't been properly thought through. And I'll, I'll finish with our friends from the upstream, uh, Equinor uh, in particular, have told me that it's uh, impossible to manage this um, monitoring of X, X or, or former wells that are underwater. The technology doesn't exist yet. And it will take a very, very uh, decent amount of time uh, to make sure that this can be done properly. And it's not to say that we can't have that ambition, but to actually say now this is what you must do is probably, again, as I say, bordering from the onerous to the ridiculous. Uh, in any case, there's plenty of things that are sublime within the, uh, within the package. Uh, and I think that I would like to leave on the, on the positive note of saying that we do recognize the efforts that the European Commission have made, and they have many ways reinforced uh, the gas market, which we see as a positive, uh, because we do believe the gas market is functioning, despite the fact that people are complaining about the way that prices are evolving at the moment, the market itself is responding to price signals, which is what it was always intended to do. Uh, Andres, please. Uh, I think I probably... Thank you, James. It was very, very rich. A lot of issues that you, you raised. Uh, on methane, I, at this time, we will keep it more separate. Uh, yes. So uh, we have will have another. But I think it's very important to mention because everything comes together. It's, 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 you can't separate these issues. But uh, as I said, the requirements, uh, I think we can go more in detail because also this reporting, there are some, uh, some uh, considerations that some things could be fine-tuned in it. But uh, uh, let's move uh, to Ilaria. Uh, Ilaria, please, uh, uh, what do you think about the package? You're definitely very much involved uh, in all the work uh, that was in preparations for it, and uh, you have followed very closely. Ilaria, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andris. Yes, well, I guess that um, most uh, around the, this new package has been... Uh, uh, already said, uh, there are many points have been already brought up to the discussion and I see also there are many questions from the audience. So I will be very quick and uh, just uh, recap a little bit what uh, um, the status of discussion within foreign school is on the package. Of course, we are at the beginning of the discussion and uh, we are going to go more in depth into some specific issues uh, today, but also in the in next uh, in next uh, uh, workshops and uh, debates, and we look forward to discussing with the, all the actors in the energy market. Uh, so uh, we um, structured this uh, intervention around four main uh, concepts. Uh, these are, in fact, the, some of the main general provisions included in the package. Um, uh, sorry, from. Voilà. From uh, uh, the first box on the upper uh, left corner, 
uh, network, we already heard that, uh, in fact, uh, the package addresses very clearly uh, the, uh, what the uh, regulation for the existing and future networks for uh, gas uh, should be. Uh, we uh, were pretty uh, satisfied to see that the main regulatory pillars are unchanged uh, for decarbonized gas and hydrogen networks. We, in the course of the last months, we were um, insisting that, in fact, the, uh, the main pillars, the funding pillars of uh, uh, gas, European gas regulation uh, should have, uh, should, should be maintained also in the future. And this is exactly what the package uh, delivers. So ownership and bundling, uh, the, the separation uh, between network, between basically uh, generation and uh, operation of the network, the separation of the regulated asset base and the concept of TPAs, of, of TPA, of uh, third party access are, uh, we, we think, pretty clearly addressed. Um, so in this sense, uh, we have, a, a, we would like to give a positive feedback. Uh, there are maybe some question marks, uh, something we should uh, uh, better understand, particularly as Dennis already mentioned, the phasing out of ITO, uh, the ITO model, which has been uh, in place and considered uh, um, satisfactory. So um, we, uh, perhaps we should better understand the logic behind uh, the decision of, uh, um, of facing out of, uh, of the ITO, particularly as uh, we discussed that uh, this uh, provision today could uh, jeopardize investments in the, in the hydrogen networks in some cases. Um, then uh, when it comes to definitions, um, well, approaching, let's say, the market side, uh, the package includes definitions for uh, low carbon gas and low carbon hydrogen, low carbon fuels, um, and also the uh, definitions for renewable gas and renewable hydrogen are uh, linked back to other existing uh, uh, regulation, particularly to the to the uh, REST directive, to REST two. Um, we uh, are. Uh, we, we think that for, uh, further clarity is needed. That the job is basically a job on taxonomy uh, is not uh, done yet. Let's say with this package, um, particularly uh, when it comes to the uh, we, to to the definition of the uh, minus seventy percent greenhouse gases emissions reduction threshold and also the definition of life cycle assessment. We think these are two very important concepts but, and we understand that they will be the uh, subject of uh, a further uh, delegated act. So we think that uh, some important uh, provisions uh, are included in this package, but the job is not yet completed in defining clearly uh, renewable gas and uh, low carbon gas. Particularly, we had a question mark, and it's something we could uh, actually uh, ask today to Augustine and, and anyway uh, discuss further on, um, particularly regarding hydrogen, which is produced from biomass. We were uh, brainstorming internally here with the researchers, and uh, we uh, probably we might have missed it, but we see we think that this definition, definition of renewable of uh, hydrogen coming from uh, uh, biomass produced from biomass, so biothermal gasification or biopyrolysis, uh, we, we didn't understand in which category it uh, it would uh, um, to which category it would belong. So maybe a clarification in this sense uh, would be needed. When it comes to consumers, we are very much um, uh, aligned with the previous uh, statements. We think that uh, the provisions uh, aiming at aligning. Um, uh, say that the, the provisions for, for electricity consumers have been uh, duly mirrored also for gas, uh, particularly regarding consumer empowerment, uh, all uh, provisions about switching, the, uh, a, a more frequent issuing of energy bills, uh, smart metering, uh, provisions regarding comparison, comparison tools and uh, those uh, aiming at making custom customers more active are all very good initiatives uh, that bring the gas sector more in line with the, the electricity sector in this case. And last but not least, security of supply. 
um, the package extends the scope to renewable and low carbon gases and also addresses the issue of cybersecurity. Uh, additionally, um, we appreciate the measures, voluntary measures for member states. So the idea of setting minimum storage obligations, incentives for gas storage bookings, and also the integration of storage into the transmission system of network operators. Uh, here, there's also the uh, um, option of uh, uh, joint purchasing, as we know, and uh, we understand the logic in uh, letting it uh, um, as, a, as, a, as an optional measure, as a voluntary measure. Um, uh, we do not believe that uh, uh, joint um, procurement of gas uh, could uh, be um, a successful solution in the long term. Uh, we discussed this also in a previous um, online debate just last week, uh, because we think that uh, due to the current uh, gas market volatility, setting um, uh, a certain price for a long term, uh, even though even when purchased uh, collectively could uh, in fact uh, be detrimental for, uh, for European citizens, because the, the price, the gas price set today uh, is uh, is likely to be extremely volatile in the next uh, weeks, and therefore we uh, believe that the advantages of um, uh, purchasing jointly purchasing gas today for long term is uh, uh, quite minimum. Uh, this said, uh, gener in general, um, we uh, the Florida School of Regulation uh, welcomes this uh, this package, uh, but the, here I can only repeat. Um, Andres's words in the opening of this online debate, we think that the package has been a, a tremendous step in uh, the regulation of, of the gas, uh, the gas markets, and particularly the Commission had a very difficult task in uh, trying to um, integrate and reconcile um, an existing, uh, an existing uh, functioning uh, gas market with uh, um, markets, that markets that are nascent or non-existing. So in doing this, uh, obviously the, the commission had to address um, the double purpose of uh, um, facilitating the market uptake of uh, the clean gases, while at the same time trying to not to um, disrupt too much the uh, functioning of the, of the current gas market. So in this, I also join Andres in saying uh, well done uh, for this package and we look forward to uh, for the discussion. Thank you very much, Ilaria. Uh, now it's uh, to Keith. Uh, Keith, the floor is yours for our opening statement. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the, uh, for the invitation to, to make some uh, comments and share some thoughts on the gas package. I will uh, share my screen. I hope it works. Can you see it? Yes, we do. We do. Thank you very much. So um, uh, a lot has been said already, and uh, it's it's. Uh, I, I agree that it's great to see this uh, comprehensive set of measures to promote uh, renewable and low carbon gases on which I've uh, worked a lot uh, in the past for uh, gas for climate and the European hydrogen backbone. Um, it's now recognized as an important part of the energy transition alongside uh, electrification, and that's a, that's a good thing. Um, in the discussion we hear, uh, and in the package, we hear a lot about hydrogen, and that's important, it's important uh, vector for uh, future decarbonization. But today I would like to highlight biomethane uh, because it needs to be kept in mind as well when we look at the package and all aspects of it uh, and not least uh, the development uh, of the grids. So uh, first, uh, a little bit of uh, background. Uh, I think there's an urgent need to scale up uh, biomethane uh, much more rapidly than we're seeing now. Um, and that's uh, for, uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, uh, very uh, uh, timely, it's a security of supply. Uh, we can produce uh, much more biomethane domestically within the EU, 
And uh, right now we're only producing 15% of our gas, and that could be uh, uh, increased uh, by uh, deploying biomethane in a faster way. Uh, it's the first time that we can say it's cheaper than natural gas. Um, in the current energy price uh, crisis, uh, domestic, domestically produced biomethane, uh, which costs about uh, maybe 70, 80 euros, and in good cases, uh, 50 euros, uh, offers a cheaper alternative to natural gas, even more so, of course, when you include uh, the CO2 price, which would add uh, like another 20 euros to that, uh, to that difference. It can help a rapid uh, climate mitigation because it's uh, existing proven technology, uh, which can be scaled up rapidly uh, to reduce climate emissions across a number of hard to abate uh, energy demand sectors. Um, it has the infrastructure, can be transported through existing gas grids and uh, immediately offers a major uh, way to transport renewable energy, transport to, uh, renewable energy through uh, the EU. And finally, uh, it's a, a very important uh, uh, development for rural employment. Uh, it uh, can drive circular agriculture and it can improve soil health. So that's why I think it, it deserves uh, more attention. And I'm happy to say that there's uh, a lot of support building up. Uh, there's a value chain initiative, uh, including also important companies on the demand side now. Uh, that is ready uh, to work on this uh, scaling up. And we're working together with the European Biogas Association uh, to put this into practice. Then over to uh, what it means for the gas package. And here uh, it's back to my personal opinions, not speaking on behalf of this initiative. Um, first of all, a target. I agree with, uh, with James that we need a target, uh, even if it's informal. Uh, but uh, much uh, rather see a formal target. Um, for example, the 350 terawatt hours, that is uh, the number in EC modeling for 2030, or the 8% of final gas demand that the uh, gas for climate has uh, proposed, or maybe also a greenhouse gas intensity uh, target uh, for gases in the European system. Any of those could work, but we need a driver, a driver for demand, a driver for production. Second point, I think uh, biomethane is an important renewable energy factor by itself. It's, it shouldn't be lumped under gas or natural gas. It's uh, one of the means to replace it together with hydrogen. Um, we should recognize its specific strengths. Uh, we should develop those and facilitate those. For example, in hybrid heat pumps, it can help consumers make the switch uh, because uh, they can use their existing gas boiler uh, they can keep their existing meter and still make a big step uh, towards decarbonizing in the first place uh, by uh, uh, allowing a heat pump to uh, deliver their uh, base load heat, but also by uh, supplying the remaining gas from renewable sources. Another specific strength is, is its use as feedstock. It's a way uh, of introducing renewable carbon into the system and we need it for negative emissions. Um, can be a very practical way to realize bioenergy with CCS, for example, in an, a reformer uh, where you make hydrogen out of biomethane, you put the CO2 uh, into the ground and then you've effectively taken the CO2 from the atmosphere and put it back into the ground. It's one of the few practical implementations of negative emissions that we have, so we should cherish it. Then uh, turning to the grids, I think we should talk about methane grids and hydrogen grids now. Um, the methane grid needs a long-term planning too. It's not just part of a phase out of natural gas. It's one of the means to replace natural gas in future. And you can see that in EU scenarios, there are significant quantities of biomethane and synthetic methane. And also the transport with, uh, between member states could become significant. So uh, what we would need, I think, is priority access for biomethane to the methane grids, and also a way to deal with the cost of reverse flow, because uh, just as in electricity grids, we're now starting to see that uh, some regions um, that traditionally only used methane will now become uh, producers of methane. So sometimes you will need to bring it from the low pressure to the medium pressure. 
Um, another point is that uh, there will be national obligations, we think, uh, for a share of biomethane. And then we should already start thinking of how uh, that can be uh, provided from uh, different member states and how it can be tradable and how it can be counted at the point of use. Because in that case, there will not be a subsidy in the country of production. It will just be a commercial pro product to comply with an obligation in one of the member states that uh, would introduce such national obligations. And then finally, speaking about uh, the neighborhood uh, of the EU, I think uh, there has been a lot of talk uh, about producing hydrogen uh, in Ukraine, North Africa. But I think especially when you look at a country like Ukraine, it would be very suitable for large scale biomethane production for exports to the EU. And uh, that could certainly have an impact on our long term planning for the methane grid. Um, and one other thought, we think that it would be useful to allow joint projects with neighboring uh, countries, uh, like it is possible in renewable electricity. Um, uh, we think that could be important for the development both of biomethane, for example, in the Ukraine, uh, and also for hydrogen in uh, North Africa. With that, I would like uh, to conclude my uh, contribution, Andres. Thank you, Keith, and thank you for your uh, co audience for the questions. I will start with the ones that uh, is quite important question. It's not only formal. This is the exclusion or changes in the uh, uh, opportunities for different models for hydrogen networks, as exclusion of ITO. And there's a question comes, was it worth to do it differently with hydrogen compared with gas and electricity? Uh, if there is no clear evidence that it is will be supported to create some uncertainty in the investments of uh, network companies. And uh, definitely everybody will be looking on Dennis' view. Is this ITO issue so important that it needed to be reflected in the package? And uh, that's definitely is, uh, the view of some of the questions that I said, I got that, well, what evidence uh, is behind it uh, or uh, why it will improve the uh, hydrogen supply to the market and any other panelists. But I think, Dennis, you would be the right person to answer on this. Thank you, Andris. Happy to come in on this issue, which indeed is, is open for debate, of course, uh, like many things are. Um, I think the claim is not that the current ITO model is completely dysfunctional. Um, because some people I saw in the question, some people, what is now actually the issue? Is it not working? I mean, you can make an ITO model work. It's not impossible. Uh, the question is, do we want to continue a legacy from the past into and con continue that also into the hydrogen world, which doesn't start from the same history as the natural gas world? Um, it's interesting to hear the arguments about that it would lead to a lack of investments. I mean, if you go back 15 years in history when the third package was being discussed, the exact same argument was made by the then integrated companies against any form of unbundling, saying, if you go move towards unbundling, there'll be no investments in the European gas system. The gas system will not function anymore, which turned out to be not particularly true. So I'm not immediately convinced that this abandoning of the ITO or phasing out of the ITO, at least for hydrogen, uh, would lead to a lack of investments. Um, we're not claiming, I mean, it's not our proposal, eh? Augustin can speak for himself and uh, for the commission. Um, I don't think we claim that the ITO model is completely dysfunctional, but it's a burden from the past. Do we need to keep it? I don't think so. Is it better to, I mean, we're comparing two systems, one with the ITO, one without the ITO. You could have both, both could be made to work, but the ITO requires more, more oversight. Um, do we need it? Probably not. Okay. Any other on ITO uh, from panelists? Uh, I think Petro already made in his statement, but you are welcome to come back on this issue. Or any other issue like role of DSOs uh, in the, uh, in the uh, package that uh, seems not reflected enough? Well, I think that I made a clear statement on this, that uh, as we said, we, uh, we as ENSOC have uh, DSOs operating currently in, in gas business in under all uh, all regimes. Uh, we just point to the fact that we, there is this lack of, of clarity of the future for, for certain parts of, of, uh, of our constituency that, that, that really after 2030 that there is uh, OU or ISO proposed and then it it's creates certain implications for, for the inter integrated company that can be translated into lack of clarity of how they could operate should they then divest parts of their 
uh, activities as vertical in, in integrated uh, uh, companies. So I think that this is this is the point. And on on this oversight, I could say that uh, uh, it's it's it, it like it like it was mentioned. So so all, all of them function perfectly without any any evidence that it, it's not possible to 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 be uh, efficient. But anyhow, we see that it as a as as a possibility to operate under all the regimes on a level playing field for for all all sorts of uh, unbounding models. Okay, any else? Yeah, I can just jump in. Yeah, if go in. Yeah, it, it, it's a good it's a good question in a way in the, in the sense that the commission have put this this to the industry as well by suggesting this. And in Eurogas, of course, you represent many different interests, and we are wrestling with it uh, because there, are, of course. Uh, many who are from the wholesale market side more who are support of what Dennis has said and the, what the European Commission are proposing. Of course, we also represent distribution system operators who are perhaps close to what Piotr says. Uh, you know, and they're questioning me and saying, how do we attach an electrolyzer maybe by 100 meters of pipe to the distribution grid? And we can't actually own that pipe is the way that they read the horizontal unbundling. And so I have to confess, Andres, you catch uh, Eurogas and a bit on the hop on this one because we're discussing it internally. So I apologize that I haven't been able to be very forthright on this one, but uh, I think it will take us weeks, if not months, to come to a proper understanding of what our position should be. The original position Eurogas had was that hydrogen should be treated in the same way as natural gas has been treated, i.e. through the third package and unbundling. The question then is only being raised really, I suppose, about this ownership unbundling and the, and, and the sort of what we'd call horizontal. And so that's, that's where we have a, a philosophical discussion, to be frank. Uh, about what this means. Uh, Dennis has mentioned some people said it was the end of their business if you don't have this and it, and it didn't happen, and others genuinely feel that it is the end of their business. So we are wrestling with it, and that's all I can say really at this stage. So uh, Augustine can probably uh, smile because I'm sure that the Commission realised that it is a challenge for different parts of the, set, of the industry to, to, to get their heads and get their grips around this one. So yeah, thanks. Good. Uh, uh, if we can move to another very contentious issue, it is a balance, indirect balance between blending and clean hydrogen supply. Uh, I would just have, uh, there was a general question, but like uh, what Ronnie asks, he says, well, is the use of gas network for transporting hydrogen not across subsidy as such? Uh, what is the use of blended hydrogen? It can no longer be used for hard to abate applications like chemistry and steel making. And at the same time, blending is, is very, very, it's quite a lot in the package. So, yes, you could argue for in favor of one of all, but at the end of the day, you need to get a balance right because market participants always try to blend or to, to, to supply clean hydrogen accordingly of nuances of the package. So how you would say, is a, is a balance right here or it, it's still not there? Who would start uh, on this? Yeah. Oh, I like. I maybe I'll say something that also relates back to this uh, previous point. And, and in fact, we could say that if you are having a situation as, as envisaged, then we suspect that, that actually will encourage uh, blending, uh, so that you will have a direct application of things like electrolyzers onto the distribution grid with minimum uh, of fuss, which would then allow, uh, yeah. Uh, blending to occur. The European Commission, of course, has foreseen blending. And I think that in Eurogas, we fully support uh, the idea that blending will be uh, part of the decarbonisation pathway. It is not a means to an end, and it's not, I'm sorry, it's not, it's not a means to an end in itself. That's what I mean. It's not, it's not that we see blending forever in Eurogas. We definitely see that in time, you will have uh, dedicated pipes develop. The reality is, nevertheless, that blending is that step-by-step -step approach to decarbonizing the gas grid. Now, of course, there are some end uses which don't be able to use blending, but I tell you what, there are many that can. Much of industry and, and household use is attached to the, attached to the gas uh, grid as it, as it currently stands. They will be able to use for low-grade heat uh, that blended, and that will, re will result in the reduction of uh, GHG emissions within those savings in a relatively easy fashion. So we do see that blending is a useful tool. I think the European Commission are hesitant, although we've interpreted the way that we could, uh, the unbundling rules may actually lead to a sort of long-term unbundling, because uh, blending, because it will uh, result actually in an easier option for DSOs and TSOs. But in essence, I really have never really understood the main opposition and said blending, uh, because actually it's reutilizing grid 
rather than going through the expensive business of building a hydrogen grid alongside an existing grid. As long as you plan, as long as you're demonstrating with your hydrogen plants that you will go through blending over the next 20 years to developing that dedicated grid, for me, there is very little reasonable, and I mean reasonable, uh, reason for you know opposing um, the blending uh, provisions as we see them. So I would say, yes, good. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, somebody maybe, else? Yeah. Maybe to weak on this as, uh, as our position is that we see blending as an important uh, part of ramping up the hydrogen market, especially in this first stage. And, and we see uh, a lot of synergies with retrofitting of our existing assets. So if there is possibility to, uh, to, to include uh, growing number of, of, uh, of volume of hydrogen into, into network via blending and, and via this decarbonized uh, overall, um, I would say overall uh, uh, energy energy situation. It's uh, it's a, it's a one avenue that we should also follow. That we shouldn't put it aside. Of course, it's not uh, it's not something that maybe will be applied unilaterally universally along all energy system in Europe. But there there are certain uh, countries regions that want to follow that path, and they shouldn't be deterred from this. Okay, uh, I don't see anybody have, uh, wanted to jump in. Then the issue on the supply. I think James mentioned one very important issue that uh, that is definitely crucial, that we basically need to de define still by delegated act uh, using life cycle approach, what is a low carbon uh, um, hydrogen, low carbon gas, low carbon fuels, because we know 70%, but what is the methodology behind it? And uh, there is also issues that this methodology should be compatible with renewables. So that's, we need somehow to, does you feel some other issues that need to be dealt on the supply side uh, that uh, investors that would like to invest in low carbon hydrogen need to understand better? So at this stage, are there something else missing behind this delegated act so where we would wish to all would wish that it already be said in this regulation or, or on this uh, in this package but we understand that it takes a bit of time really to to estimate all the submissions that would be uh, in the value chain uh, for low carbon gases uh, but are there something else that you would say on supply side we need to think about it Not so much. So basically, it seems that this supply side or definition side on certification side seems well done, with the exception of these general questions that we would like to know what exactly will be taken into account where I will produce low carbon, uh, low carbon uh, hydrogen from methane. So well, I think nobody else is jumping in, Andres. So I'm going to answer you because I think your question deserves a response. Uh, I mean, in principle, uh, what we have said at the beginning or what I've said at the beginning is what, where we stand. I think the reality is that we have to wait until 2024 for a delegated act. We see with the taxonomy, for example, how delegated acts are far from a smooth uh, instrument. It could be quite a long time until we're given that methodology. I said at the beginning, what does this mean? This means that we aren't really, how can you give an investor certainty if we don't understand what it is that we're trying to invest in until possibly 2025? Given that there's a sort of a general feeling amongst the public and I say in industry that there is a climate emergency, it seems a little bit slow. One ought to think that there ought to be a better uh, mechanism for trying to get investments up. Case has touched on it. Uh, we've touched on it. We believe that targets are a very good way of driving that quick investment because you give investors certainty now. They know that it's in the legislation. They know that it's unlikely to be taken out. Therefore, people can start moving. If you say, well, there might be low carbon hydrogen in 2026, investors aren't going to necessarily move. That's dangerous because that just means people continue on with business as usual. And I think that's the risk that you face. Every person I know says that the more that you backlog decarbonization, whether it's electricity, whether it's buildings, whether it's gas, the more that you backlog, the more that you push it back, the more expensive and the more challenging it is to achieve it by 2050. So we would have liked to see a bit more urgency and a bit more pace injected into this uh, package in terms of demand drivers. There aren't any. I know people say, yes, there's reductions of tariffs. And this, in the impact assessment, it says the impact of those, of those tariff reductions is less than 1% on the cost of the renewable gases. 
and you need a carbon price of about 350 to do the switching. So uh, even with the great carbon price we have today, very far from doing that. If you don't put demand drivers in and you wait for the carbon price to be 350, well, Andres, your guess is as good as mine. This is a failing of the package. This is a failing to give security to investors to say that you should be moving towards hydrogen, renewable gases, et cetera, et cetera. It's not there. And without those demand drivers, well, it's a kind of business as usual scenario, isn't it? As I said at the beginning, it's good news for the gas market in a sense. The market, the basically the package is saying the gas market works and we will support it. But on the other side, which we like, on the other side, it's not giving us what we want, which is the change that is expected. So yeah, sorry to bang on about it, Andres, but nobody else wanted to take the floor. So I reiterate the point that I made at the beginning, but it needs to be said. And you've asked the question, I think it's, it's right. There are elements that are missing and those will be crucial. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, James. Andres. Uh, yes, I, I, still there. Just uh, an additional point. I fully understand, of course, James's position on the need to drive demand. I will make one, I would make one step back and uh, focus really on the need for having clear definitions. This is uh, something which, of course, provide could provide um, efficient signals for investments, but it is needed nevertheless, I would say. So uh, that's why uh, we insist also on the importance of a clear taxonomy. Uh, my question earlier on regarding where uh, should hydrogen produced from biomass be classified also uh, belongs to this uh, wider question. Um, it's very difficult to capture reality in one directive of, or one regulation also because technologies to produce uh, renewable and low carbon gases are evolving. They are very uh, varied, fragmented. There are many elements which could uh, be taken into account. But I think we, uh, in, in the last couple of years, um, the fog has slightly dissipated, <laughs> at least. And I think the Commission took some very important steps in trying to define a clear taxonomy. Although we see that uh, what seems particularly important nowadays is to try and come up with the a taxonomy which is as much aligned as possible, uh, you know, um, among the different uh, regulatory initiatives. So the taxonomy for sustainable finance um, and also uh, and the, the, the regulatory package, so this hydrogen and the carbonized gas markets package, the uh, um, definitions for renewable gas uh, in the in the uh, in the rest directive uh, and revising the in the fit for 55 package. And also, um, since we think that this, uh, the job is not done yet, as I said in the beginning, um, you know, I think we should uh, really uh, try to make an effort and come up with uh, uh, a, a definition for these gases, which is as uh, universally uh, shared as possible. Um, yeah, I would stop here. If, if Christopher would be here, he uh, would mention that uh, there, there is also a slight misalignment uh, in this threshold, minus uh, 70%, which in the uh, energy taxation directive seems to be a little bit higher. But this I would leave it to, to Christopher to say, has he uh, looked into the issue more closely? I think at this stage we can go to Augustine. And uh, I, Augustine, before uh, giving you the floor, uh, I would say the perception you get is, is, is like a glass full, half full, half empty. From one side, everybody recognizes the package is well done and well thought over. So that's it is. From other side, it is a feeling that there's something missing for driving the investments. That there is something that is still needed, and James formulated well uh, targets for demand. Something that is would would really capture investors' attention in real action. So it seems like something is still needed there. But definitely you have discussed many times with your colleagues, with stakeholders, and you are well placed again to repeat what is the main pillars, what are the main ideas, and, and perhaps you could also capture some of the questions that are also in the audience. For example, that also I, I, I'm not particularly excited, but why Enso, e, Enso Ash could not is called a bit more complicated, Enoch, I think. So it's not an important question, but perhaps it was important question it is was done differently so so please uh augustine whatever you would like really to capture the main issues that you believe that any debate on this package should capture because anyhow everybody recognizes you did their big job and very important job in advancing the compensation augustine um so Andres, many thanks first of all for inviting me um 
it's uh, the package is out. It's a, a big pile of paper and burden has fallen from my shoulder for a little moment, and uh, the public debate has started. Um, the um, what I will, thought maybe is useful to do is give a little bit of background on the various uh, uh, elements of thinking of the commission, uh, because it provides, I think, an important uh, background for the kind of choices which have been made and uh, which uh, have, are now also driving the debate a little bit. So, um, uh, first of all, maybe it's useful in terms of process to say that, uh, yes, we published a, um, a uh, proposal on the 15th of December, but uh, by the words of a minimal non-EU uh, famous politician, this is uh, uh, not the end, it is the end of the beginning, and uh, the um, um, uh, the, the uh, let's say the, the commission has given the, the starting, the, 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 let's say the place from which the debate starts and the public debate is taking place uh, uh, right now. And, and, is, and I mean, this debate we have today is all just part of this. Um, and we see the period which is in front of us as one where we engage with stakeholders, seek views. And evidently we have done our best to put the best on the table we can. Uh, but uh, the world is always a bit more complicated than uh, you imagine, and we want to go into the interinstitutional process on the best basis possible. And this is fortunately also possible um, because uh, the French presidency has decided, uh, yes, in the council will debate uh, on the package, but it will be more an informative stage. They will focus on uh, reaching um, a council position on, uh, on elements of the package, uh, which was proposed in July last year. Uh, and that gives us the time to engage in a constructive way with all stakeholders. Um, I think you formulated it quite well uh, that uh, um, I think the debate is uh, not so much on the fundamental elements of the, uh, the package as, as far as I've seen now. Um, uh, it's, I, I personally believe that the glass is always half full, but they also know very well that uh, in order to make everybody happy, uh, the glass has to be made fully full. And I think debate uh, would needs to be, uh, let's say, start here. So um, maybe it's useful to say that uh, I'm not going to explain the package in detail because in fact, some of the participants have already done this in a very elegant way. But maybe it's useful to emphasize one thing which relates to the, uh, the approach we took a little bit when it comes to hydrogen. Um, there are, of course, strong similarities uh, with, nat with natural gas, but there are also differences. Um, and these similarities uh, are reflected in the fact that we use quite a bit of the, the regulatory structure, which you know from gas and electricity, and we know we have functions. Um, uh, but there are also differences. And I think that one of the most important differences is that um, in, as opposed to the situation where we uh, were when we liberalized the electricity markets, which was at that moment in time already a fairly mature industry, um, for hydrogen, this is not the case. So this has implied two, uh, let's say there are various implications of this. First of all, immature uh, sector hydrogen means uh, we, we introduce a stage approach, therefore we need of, um, of uh, different phases where less, more flexibility is needed in the beginning in order to have uh, investment models, uh, let's say, develop uh, more easily and to have a bottom-up uh, development of a progressively integrated high network, but at the same time to provide legal certain, let's say, a, a horizon against which investments can act, energy investments are long term. So we really wanted to set out the main regulatory principles also for the longer run. Um, so this stage approach is one consequence. The other consequence is that where the rules for natural gas and electricity uh, were maybe a little bit the result of what was possible at the time, uh, we are now in a situation where we can, uh, let's say, look forward and see what the the end goal uh, can be. And by giving a more precise perspective to some of the key players in the sector, um, let's say move to a more simplified world where um, 
at lower administrative costs and with higher certainty for market for non-regulated activities, we can, uh, let's say, move, move on. And that, of course, connects to the debate of uh, unbundling. Um, there are a number of examples where we have uh, sought that we could uh, take advantage of the greenfield uh, approach when it comes to the fact that um, we, we are looking at a sector which is, which is relatively underdeveloped. If we now create uh, clarity as to the rules which will exist in the longer run, we can actually uh, deal with the unbundling issue at relatively low regulatory cost, because it's not just the fact, of course, that uh, ITOs need higher regulatory burden, has a higher regulatory burden, as Dennis emphasized rightly so, but of course also um, um, the when now the uh, the vertical integration in the hydrogen sector is very low, so if we make this clear now, we can actually do this at relatively uh, low transaction costs, contrary to the situation when we were in the uh, liberalizing gas and electricity sector. So this is part of the background of the thinking of the unbundling rules, and there's plenty of time to for the existing vertically integrated uh, companies which operate on an I to adapt uh, until 2030. Um, and I, uh, uh, I have, um, must say, difficulties understanding uh, this uh, investment argument, which is made in the context has been said before. Um, this was the same argument which was used when we talked about unbundling in the past. Um, uh, it is a bit giving, um, uh, it is shouting that there's a fire breaking out, maybe breaking out, but in reality probably it doesn't because, and it was even suggested that um, people are active in the, uh, are vertically created in the companies now, and I've seen it also in other fora, would have to part from their network assets, or at least make a choice between production, supply, and other network assets in the future. This is incorrect. This is just simply wrong. And it is, uh, um, the, uh, for those companies which uh, are physically integrated today, the ISO model is available. It just, it means, of course, a change, um, but it is not a change which means that you um, have to part from your assets because the requirements which apply to these unbundled models can be complied with within the same company. So I would like to underline uh, this point, which is actually something we looked uh, at specifically, including the question where the synergies between hydrogen and natural gas um, as, uh, let's say, operations can be made within the same company. So this has been part of our reflection. On incentives and targets. Um, uh, well, there, I heard some bitter complaining about the lack of targets. Um, the, um, I, I say actually um, here uh, maybe we should really look at the at the um, at the fact that the glass is certainly half full because if you see the the, the previous separation between uh, what the role of market rules was and from instruments such as DTS or the renewables directives or the energy efficiency. Um, part of my st standard storyline was that to say that the July package which is going to take care of the incentivization and making sure that we're going to reach the 2030-45 uh, target. Um, um, and that um, the market rules are there only to uh, enable this and make this possible. And it is indeed a, a very important part of the package. But in fact, this package for the first time uh, does, does not only serve the purpose of uh, making markets work, but also creates uh, uh, contains elements where the incentivization of decarbonization is key present. And it has to do, uh, for instance, to the um, with the rebates on the uh, low carbon and renewable gases which exist um, at the methane side of the regulation, um, and uh, also the the possibility, I should say, possibility um, at the discretion of member states to uh, have uh, cross subsidies within the energy system, which um, uh, would uh, can help to uh, 
overcome some hurdles at the ramp up phase of an hydrogen network. So this is actually a recognition of the of the decarbonization objective within the current framework, which is actually new to the package as a whole. Let me some debate on zero tariffs and ITC mechanisms. Um, well, this is part of certainly the methane side of the incentivization um, element. But I think here, I, I put it a bit bluntly just to make it clear uh, as, a, as a black and white picture, but that's, is that um, uh, the rules which we have proposed ultimately are not meant to uh, facilitate the life of TSOs and regulators, um, but they are there to serve the, um, the interest of our citizens. And the choice for zero tariffs at the border really comes from the fact that we anticipate that in the future, the production of uh, low carbon and renewable uh, methane and hydrogen is most likely to be much more domestic than we have under the current uh, uh, natural gas market. And therefore the importance of having a level playing field at the production side is more important than we had in the past. Whereas the tariff setting, especially in the gas side, had more to do with infrastructure. Now we also have to look at the production side of the energy sector. And here, essentially, we import concepts uh, which have been used at the electricity side, where uh, production is already much more, uh, let's say, in, in inter, uh, um, let's say, EU, and where this uh, has led to the consequence that Okay, it's it's not completely white, but um, that in general, the, the 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 tariffs on the production side are the same, and it is especially to make sure that the assets which are being dispatched at the electricity side are done, dispatched in an efficient way. I think this should not be forgotten. Yes, this has implications on the on how you finance cross-border infrastructure and how in the future. Uh, we're going to work uh, cross border between TSOs on to make sure that uh, everybody gets the money they deserve, they should have. Um, this is not an easy task. I I'm, I'm do not underestimate the, easy, that the fact that this can be complicated. But it's, of course, a task for which we have some experience with the electricity side. Um, and uh, is also a task on which we can prepare thoroughly. Uh, for instance, on the Harrison side, uh, this issue is only really coming up in at best at the earliest in 10 years time. Uh, but uh, having it spread out now man, means that we create clarity and we can prepare for this event. Um, then on the uh, blending issue, well, I think it's already clear since the uh, publication of the Harrison strategy that when it comes to blending, uh, we are rather skeptical and it has to do with the perspective demand side for hydrogen, which is in our projections, at least for the duration of the current regulatory cycle, primarily in the transportation and in the industrial sites. And those simply are not held with blended hydrogen. Um, and that has, um, whereas in other applications, there are other either um, uh, lower cost uh, alternatives for decarbonization, or there's at least competition with uh, different means where uh, we can put uh, different priorities. Electrification first, that needs to be repeated. And then comes for the difficult to abate sectors, comes uh, gaseous uh, fuels. Um, the um, doesn't mean indeed that we have no blending debate also from our side and that we think that the, uh, there should be rules around that. Um, mentioned already by several participants, there's this 5% threshold, which I need to emphasize because the misunderstanding exists is not a target. It is a rule which says that uh, basically TSOs have to accept blended gas until 5% from when it comes from across the border. It's a relatively low threshold, um, but that it is also because above uh, costs of blending start to uh, increase, especially at the end application side. And we should not have a situation where the blending decision of country A imposes high costs on uh, the end application sector and of consumers in country B. Um, 
that doesn't mean that um, uh, the users cannot agree to a higher blending rate if necessary. Um, and it also doesn't mean, because the constraint is on the cross-border point, that within a country there are more degrees of freedom as to what you want to do. Uh, but it does clearly frame the cross-border uh, side of things. It is really important because if we would not do that, we would soon find ourselves in a situation where cross-border interoperability is no longer uh, a given, has never been a full given, but certainly with, with the divergent uh, blending rates, this will be no longer the case. So it's really important to frame this and to have uh, quite some hard rules around that. Um, there was um, um, so another debate relates to the missing pieces. Well, um, well, I think it's fair to say that uh, when it comes to the missing pieces, uh, the glass is also half full in the sense that we uh, complemented the renewables directive by a definition of uh, low carbon hydrogen. Uh, which is uh, uh, is a step uh, forward, but it is also true. I think that is very fair comment that uh, having a number of seventy percent creates some clarity, but uh, knowing how to calculate it precisely uh, is certainly part of the picture and one which we really need to deal with uh, as fast as we possibly can. Evidently, this debate is at the moment also raging at the um, at the renewable side, where we also have not set out fully what it meant uh, to be green. And that is one of the reasons why we need to, we, let's say, we need to keep this debate uh, in parallel because uh, rules which apply for renewables should, of course, also be as close as possible those for low carbon hydrogen. We cannot have different life cycle approach for renewables and hydrogen. And we cannot also, or we should, this is certainly not, uh, uh, certainly not uh, our objective. For instance, different rules on certification. Uh, and we need to keep this debate together, which means that, unfortunately, I think I'm also the one part which needs to admit that, that we are not yet able to settle this debate uh, fully. Uh, last but not least, on the governance structure, it's true that you have made a quite, uh, let's say, clear case uh, and uh, choice in terms of how we think in the future hydrogen TSOs uh, should be represented at the EU level. Um, I think we should be credible. We, we should uh, evidently guess TSOs play a very important role. We also fully recognize that it's one of the bigger drivers of having this package is that uh, we should not miss the opportunity of repurposing methane assets uh, for hydrogen. But we should also do this in a way which, um, um, let's say, provides some, um, uh, let's say, tangible guarantees that this is done in a way uh, which um, uh, means that the rules which uh, will be uh, developing slowly but surely around uh, the hydrogen sector will be set uh, really well. And I think that uh, speaks in favor of keeping the governance structure uh, separate from uh, natural gas. Um, I'm, I'm just making one little example, um, but I think there are plenty of them, is that um, uh, yes, evidently hydrogen is a gas and therefore we can borrow concepts and ideas from the natural gas sector and I think we can honestly say we did so. But of course, uh, especially when we move in a green world, uh, electrolyzers will become very important. They have very different operational conditions and um, are, uh, let's say, important to the increased network. I can well imagine, imagine, because today this is not in the package. We should set the rules when we have clarity that, for instance, the operational rules for an hydrogen network are closer to the electricity sector than we know today for natural gas. And we should have those rules set by those which have the biggest interest in setting them well. And these are um, uh, certified hydrogen network operators. The, um, this um, choice has implications as to how we're going to organize exactly the transition. Uh, we can have a long debate on it. If you have the time, we will not do that. It's just so that we have some ideas on how this should move. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that uh, whilst uh, we have to continue to have this debate, we will find different ways of doing this, even more efficient than we had had missed ourselves. I think maybe I should stop here. 
Well, thank you, Augustine. It was really very, very important what you said, and it was really comprehensive and very rich uh, statement or conclusion of the debates that we had. The purpose of this debate, our honorable stakeholders and participants, was really to introduce some elements and general perception around the package. There are many details, and we will analyze your questions, and recording is available to look on some particular aspects. It's extremely rich, just to compare this a regulation that uh, James mentioned on meeting, where I believe some fine tuning needs to be done, but generally it's rather clear what is being requested. Simple thing. This is extremely rich package, extremely nuanced and many things that need to be analyzed. So we will take uh, on this recording and all your questions, analyze where exactly we would need to have more detailed discussion and we will be always happy if commission would come and just listen to the debate and like Augustine today to make some conclusions. What is the original thinking? Because definitely there are many political options sometimes, and you need to choose cho that best suits to it, but you know that it's not ideal. So it's it's always as an issue with it. But again, congratulations for the commission for really making this bold proposal. Thank you very much for everybody who participated in this uh, debate. And let's continue to work. It's still not adopted. It will be adopted, but we are all interested uh, the work is going on already now, and a lot of countries have hydrogen strategies, and that this work that will be on the ground in promoting hydrogen goes on the right, right in the right direction. That later we will not be in the situation where we need to adjust individual actions in some particular member countries with general approach to the hydrogen markets that is we are trying to build. So I think it is an important process. It's not only theory, but actually quite strong implications for investments and member state policies on the hydrogen. Thank you very much. And I wish you all the success. Uh, and it's at least it's very interesting. So it's so it's challenging, but it's very interesting and it's very necessary in this energy situation that we have. As I mentioned at the beginning, we have a lot of question marks, a lot of issues. But what really matters is that we establish energy systems that it is sustainable and also less exposed to geopolitical risks, less exposed also to price hikes. So trying to beat more stability, still keeping market forces in. So it's really sounds nearly impossible, but I think it's manageable and we can achieve it by with the debate. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Thank you, Andres. And thanks to all the other panelists. Thanks, Great. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye